Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. We're going to go ahead and get the program started. As I look around, I'm seeing some old friends. Welcome back. Seeing some new friends that we haven't had before. Welcome. For those of you who are not familiar with us, we are the Mercatus Center at George Mason University, a research and outreach center focused on economics and the way that economics can be used as a lens through which policy decisions can be made to improve policy outcomes. We are today having the fourth and final in a four-part series of seminars on issues facing the Joint Select Committee on Debt Reduction. And today's topic of entitlement reform promises to be most enlightening. Uh, for those of you, I've been asked to, to announce, for those of you who have Twitter accounts, if you'd like to tweet, our hashtag is Mercatus Live, one word, or you can follow us at Mercatus. Uh, with that being said, I'm going to uh, move on to introduce your moderator for today. Dr. Jason Fickner is a senior research fellow at the Mercatus Center. Prior to joining us, he served in several positions with the Social Security Administration, including De Deputy Commissioner of Social Security, Chief Economist, and Associate Commissioner for Retirement Policy. Prior to the Social Security Administration, Dr. Fickner was a senior economist with the Congressional Joint Economic Committee where he did tax modeling. Dr. Fickner's primary research interests and publications address issues such as Social Security, federal tax policy, federal budget policy, retirement security, and policy proposals to encourage savings and increase investments. Dr. Fickner, in addition to his work at the Mercatus Center, serves as adjunct faculty at the Georgetown Policy, Public Policy Institute, the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, and the Virginia Tech Center for Public Administration and Policy, and he teaches courses in a number of areas dealing with public policy, public finance, and economics. Dr. Fickner earned his Bachelor of Arts degree from the University of Michigan at Ann Arbor, his Master of Public Policy degree from Georgetown University, and his PhD in Public Administration and Public Policy from Virginia Tech. Without any further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Jason Fickner. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. So we had about 85 or 90 people register for this event, so we were expecting an overflow crowd, so folks may be coming in, but we're, of course, going to get started. We have a star-studded panel here today, including the two public trustees, two former directors of the Congressional Budget Office, a director of OMB. They've had more titles and jobs than I think exist in Washington, D.C., and I think all of the budget knowledge that exists in Washington is sitting up at this table right now. So we're, I'm very pleased to have them here, and it's a great honor to be here with them. Uh, I'm going to do a little more than moderate. I'm going to start by setting the stage, and then I'll introduce each speaker as they come up. We're going to go in order down the table. Um, but we're here to talk about the Select Committee on Deficit Reduction and what sort of the challenges are facing them. And we don't want to make their job any harder than it is because it's a hard job ahead of them, but we're facing some real fiscal challenges right now. So what I kind of want to do is set the stage for you. The Joint Select Committee on Deficit Reduction, as you know, came out of the Budget Control Act of 2011 as part of an agreement to raise the debt ceiling. They are charged with finding $1.5 trillion in deficit reduction, which includes interest savings, through 2021. What does that mean? So if you use CBO's current law baseline, so current law means whatever we have that the law specifies is going to happen, which includes tax cuts, expirings, and things like that, um, the deficit reduction of $1.5 trillion would eventually get us to a debt-to-GDP ratio of 60%. That's just debt held by the public. If you include gross debt, which includes Social Security debt, the number would be about 90%. So what do we have to do to get there? Um, again, this assumes that the tax policies we have in place would expire in 2012, and that's questionable. But let's assume for a minute that Congress lets that happen. How do we get to $1.5 trillion in deficit reduction? How do we get down to 60% debt held by uh, ratio debt-to-GDP? Um, Starting in 2013, all right, so we want to get to 60% debt GDP goal by 2021. Starting in 2013, you'd have to, if you were just focusing on discretionary spending, cut 10%, starting in 2013, permanently. If you wanted to focus this on mandatory spending, 5% cut only. If you wanted to do an equal percentage of discretionary and mandatory, it's a 4% cut. If you wanted to just do taxes, just do income taxes, you'd have to increase income taxes by 7% across the board. 
If you want to do federal revenue, so all federal revenues, but only federal revenues, it's a 3% increase. If you want to do some sort of combination that was equal proportion, it'd be 2%. That would get you $1.5 trillion in deficit reduction over 10 years and get you to a debt to GDP of 60%. But that's, of course, using current law estimates. So what happens if we use CBO's current policy baseline? And current policy assumes that we're going to keep doing what we're doing, that the tax cuts will keep being extended, uh, that the AMT will keep being indexed. It also means that the plan cuts to Medicare, I mean, the so-called doc fix, aren't going to happen. But what does that mean then? So if you want to get to the $1.5 trillion and you have current policy, not current law, you'd only get your debt to GDP down to 79%, not 60 if you wanted to get 60, you would need $6.1 trillion in cuts, not 1.5. So the baseline that we're using is very important in figuring out whether or not we're going to reach a sustainable goal or not. But let's assume we're going to stick with current policy. What does that mean? Well, now you need a 46% cut in discretionary spending, where it's only 10% under current law. You would need a 21% cut in mandatory spending instead of 5 you would need a 15% cut if you were doing an equal percentage of discretionary and mandatory instead of four. You would need a 36% increase in tax income taxes only if you were just focusing on income taxes as opposed to seven. It'd be a 16% increase if you're looking at all federal revenues as opposed to 3%. Uh, an 8% if you're doing equal spending and revenue changes instead of two. So we're tough. It's going to be difficult. And where are we now? You can sort of see where we are. We are basically. Uh, near 100% of debt to GDP on a gross level, and we're a little bit above 60 on the publicly held. So the idea is, can we do something to keep this sort of consistent? It's a challenge to get us out there. Um, this, of course, is right now going to assume that we use um, current law, not current policy, and find the 1.5 trillion in cuts. How did we get here? You can see the 1971-2010 average. Um, interest was 2.2 percent of GDP. Social Security and major health care programs was 7.2. Defense was 4.8. Other mandatory spending and non-defense discretionary was 6.7. This line here represents the federal revenues, the average from 1971 to 2010, which is roughly about 18 percent. So that's where we were for the 71-2010 average. In 2007, you can see the spending, but now I'll go to 2021 for the projections under, again, this is now current law, not current policy, and all of a sudden Social Security and major health care programs drastically increase as a share of GDP. You also have interest. Now, interest, if you look at the CBO's estimates, are projected to stay relatively low. Right now, we have record low interest, and that's supposed to in some ways moderate a little higher, but continue. If our inflation picks up, or our interest costs pick up, our ability to afford our interest payments is going to be much more difficult. This is where you see that entitlement spendings have exploded. Um, here's where we are sort of right now. You can see that other spending picked up, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. But going out into the next 50 years, it really is Medicare, Medicaid, the health care spending that dwarfs the federal budget. Uh, Social Security, it is definitely a problem, but it moderates. And we'll talk about that a little bit in the rest of the program. There's some reforms we need to do to keep it solvent. Uh, but our biggest challenge really is Medicare, Medicaid. And there's a lot of questions as to how are we going to tackle health care if we aren't even tackling Social Security right now. Uh, mandatory health care spending under the CBO baseline. Again, I want to show you sort of how it picks up. You can see Medicare takes off. The rest is Medicaid chip and exchange subsidies. But again, it goes from right now a total of around 5% of GDP up to about 8% of GDP. Um, one of the things, again, we point out is what's happening to a dollar of federal spending. This is in 2011, a whole dollar. But you can see how interest payments as a share of the dollar start increasing, Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security. What this means here, for those of you who are interested in the budget process, is that we are squeezing out discretionary spending. Think about the budget process and how many fights we have on Capitol Hill today. Those fights are only going to get worse as we start decreasing the amount of money available for discretionary spending, because entitlement spending, interest in the debt, takes up more of the dollars that are coming in and being spent. So the point is, if we don't do something about this now, the problem is not only going to get worse, but the ability for the political process to handle this is only going to get worse as well. Uh, this is now Medicare expenditures under the C CMS alternate scenario. You'll see this is the 2011 trustees report, but one of the things that came out of the trustees process was the chief actuary of CMS, Rick Foster, and other parts of the process said, 
we don't think some of the estimates that went to the trustees report are going to actually happen. They're based on current law, not current policy. And they thought it was important to warn the public that if Congress were to follow current policy, not current law, then the expenditures and outlays are going to be much drastically higher than in the trustees report. So they issued an alternate memo. And you can see how under their alternative assumptions, basically spending picks up dramatically for Medicare. Instead of being around 5.2%, 5, 5 it goes up close to 10%, almost doubles. Medicare costs over time, again, this is showing that health care really is one of our major drivers of our fiscal problems. In 1975, the number of enrollees was 24.8 million. Now it's about 47.4. In 2040, it'll be 88.2 million eligible enrollees. Look at the cost per enrollee. In 75, it was $2,000. Now a little under 10,000. That's supposed to explode to about $17,000 in 2040. So again, if we don't do something to control the costs of health care, it's going to explode as well. This gets a little bit to Medicaid. So we have have Medicare. We also have a Medicaid issue. This is state and federal spending on Medicaid. And as you'll see, it's been ratcheting up since 1985, and it's supposed to explode going forward as we expand eligibility and costs under Medicaid. Social Security, again, it's less of a problem than health care, but still a problem. We now have annual cash flow deficits. So we had surpluses that were going into the trust funds since 1983 reforms. And then 2010 and 11, we're now cash flow negative. This is going to continue and deteriorate in perpetuity now unless we do something about it. We currently have a cash flow deficit of $46 billion this year, but this is from the trustees report and it kind of masks something. We have a 2% payroll tax holiday right now where people who are contributing to the program are, aren't, are paying 2% less. That revenue is being made up by the general revenue fund. Uh, but if you include that difference, that's $105 billion the cash flow coming into the system from payroll taxes, instead of being $46 billion short, is now $151 billion short. So again, in some ways, we're hiding the mask of the trust fund's problems because we have this payroll tax cut. And if we extend that next year, it makes the problem worse. And if we expand it, as President Obama has suggested, it also compounds the problems. Uh, again, we're running cash flow deficits indefinitely right now. This just shows you we really need to do something soon. We're basically at the precipice of these trust funds going insolvent and our ability to do reforms really need to happen now, sooner rather than later, because the problems are just going to compound, and our ability to actually make changes is going to get politically more difficult as we move further on down the road. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Alice Rivlin, and I'm going to do a quick introduction before you get up. Um, so Dr. Rivlin is, again, one of my policy heroes. And again, she's had, I think, more budget jobs in Washington than her jobs available, and held, I think, every senior level position um, that currently exists. Um, she is currently the visiting professor of public policy uh, at Georgetown University. She's also a senior fellow of economic studies at Brookings. She is the founding director of the Congressional Budget Office. She's been a director of the Office of Management and Budget. She is a member of the Commission on Fiscal Responsibility and Reform, a.k.a. the Simpson-Bowles Commission. She has her own budget plan with former Senator Pete Domenici, the Domenici Rivlin plan. She's been the vice chair of the Federal Reserve. She was the chair of the D.C. Financial Management um, and Assistance Authority. That was the D.C. Control Board. She has done it all. Um, it is a privilege to have her here. So with that, Alice Rivlin. Thank you very much, Jason. When you get to be as old as I am, the resume gets very long. But I'm uh, delighted to have a chance to talk about entitlements. And what I will do is talk uh, a bit generally and uh, then focus on a specific uh, proposal for Medicare. I can make, I'm not a trustee of uh, Social Security or Medicare, uh, so I'm sort of freer than my colleagues to say uh, what I think uh, ought to uh, be done, and I won't be shy about doing that. But I think the first thing to uh, realize is that uh, entitlements are absolutely t the key to stabilizing our debt uh, over time. And the Joint Select Committee has a chance to do that. You can think of various goals for uh, the uh, getting the debt and the deficit uh, under control, but the real key 
is stabilize the debt at some level, some reasonable level. Uh, in the Domenici Rivlin report, we chose 60% of GDP. We're already beyond that. Uh, but that's not a bad goal. But it doesn't much matter. Stabilize it at 65 or 68 or 70. But the track we're on now uh, doesn't work. Uh, we're on track to have the debt grow faster than the GDP, as far as the eye can see. And there is, we, we will come to a point where we're really sorry we let that happen, uh, if indeed it even can happen. Uh, at some point, our creditors will say, we don't want to lend you that much, uh, that much money. But you can't get this thing under control unless you do something about entitlements and taxes. And that's for the reasons that uh, Jason illustrated. We are uh, having a tsunami of uh, uh, older people, uh, retirees, hitting the three major programs, Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security. And we haven't figured out yet how to keep our health care costs uh, from uh, rising uh, faster than any other kind of cost. And the multiplicative effect of a huge increase, twice as many Medicare beneficiaries uh, by, uh, I forget what day, 2035, I think, as uh, in uh, uh, 2000. That's a huge increase. Uh, it's not, shouldn't be a surprise. We've known about those baby boomers for a long time. Uh, but uh, they're here now. Uh, and they will be in the, those programs over the next several uh, decades. And that means that uh, federal spending, no matter what you do to the rest of it, uh, will rise faster than GDP. And revenues won't. Revenues at any set of tax rates will rise about as fast as the economy grows. Uh, so the basic problem is this growing wedge uh, between the federal spending driven by the uh, big entitlement programs, especially health care, uh, and, uh, and the revenues. And we can't fix it unless we do something about entitlements. Now, in my opinion, we can't fix it by just doing something about entitlements either. Uh, we, if, uh, if you reform uh, the retirement programs, uh, you must do it, but you must not do it quickly. And uh, politics will not let you do it quickly. Uh, so uh, reform is, in a sort of paradoxical sense, uh, absolutely necessary way out in the, uh, uh, in the future, uh, but you're not going to make very much in the so-called 10-year window uh, just by reforming uh, retirement programs. So you have to do other things. Uh, you have to limit uh, the growth of, of um, uh, discretionary spending, both defense and domestic, uh, and uh, you have to find some more revenue somewhere. And my experience on these two commissions, which took most of my time for the last two years, uh, sitting in a room full of people of intelligence and goodwill, strongly committed to one or the other of the two parties, my experience was the same thing happened. You worked through the numbers. You worked on entitlements first, and you said, got to do something drastic, and you made proposals, and I'll come back to those. Uh, and then uh, you realized uh, you hadn't done very much in the near term, so you took on uh, discretionary spending. And after you'd done that, and this was the moment of truth for Republicans, you realized there is nothing we can do uh, by just cutting spending that will solve this uh, problem on the spending side alone, so we got to go to revenues. So um, what... Uh, what to do. Um, looking forward, uh, as Jason illustrated, Social Security doesn't look like a really big problem, uh, but for heaven's sakes it ought to be fixed. Uh, spending will go up uh, substantially as the baby boomers hit the system. Uh, and the system is not on a firm foundation uh, now. 
Uh, and uh, it's um, easy to say, well, there's uh, cash in the tell or this uh, accumulated uh, uh, surplus uh, from the interest uh, on the bonds, and then they do owe some bond, own some bonds, and those could be cashed in. So we could do nothing until around 2037, uh, and that's a long time from now, and we can worry about it then. That's ridiculous. Uh, first place, uh, it's not a very long time from now. We used to think it was a long time from now, but people who are already in the labor force uh, will be retiring in 2037. Those are the people, it's not future generations. Uh, these are your, our colleagues uh, in the uh, labor force uh, right now. Uh, they need to know what their retirement benefits uh, are, are gonna be and, and what the taxes are going to be. Uh, and on top of which, uh, it's nice to say we have money in the till, and we do, and uh, certainly the uh, benefits will be paid, uh, but uh, Treasury's going to have to borrow additional money uh, to pay off those bonds and uh, even to uh, pay for the uh, amount of accumulated interest. So uh, this is not something that can be put off. People like me have been saying this for a long time, uh, but um, the, the things that you need to do to fix Social Security are not very drastic. It's not a Ponzi scheme just because uh, we set it up so current, uh, current workers pay for uh, current beneficiaries, but it should be pretty obvious that if you set it up that way and the ratio of the uh, workers to the retirees changes dramatically, and it has, then you have to readjust the financing. Uh, and that's, uh, that's where we are. But uh, let me come to healthcare because it's so much harder, and I'll concentrate on Medicare, not because it's harder, Medicaid is really hard, uh, but because I've been thinking more about it. Um, Medicare, uh, a very large program uh, with uh, expenditures growing uh, quite rapidly, not only because uh, the uh, beneficiaries are increasing. They aren't increasing very fast yet, but uh, just you wait. Uh, and uh, because uh, the cost of providing care uh, is, uh, is uh, rising. Um, but it's also um, set up it's as a fee-for-service system with very poor incentives uh, to uh, use uh, the government's money uh, or the program's money um, efficiently. Fee-for-service uh, encourages more service. Uh, you get paid for what you do, so you do more. And doctors aren't dumb, and nobody's dumb. Uh, but uh, they, uh, uh, and believe me, I'm a Medicare recipient. Uh, I see every time I go to the doctor, the, the efforts that they go to to load on more tests and more services. Uh, and there's nothing that, uh, that really uh, discourages uh, that. So I don't, I don't think anybody denies uh, that there's a good deal of waste in our healthcare system and we don't do things very cost effectively. But the two parties, or conservatives and liberals if you like, are really gridlocked uh, over different approaches to how to fix that. Uh, the approach favored by Democrats, and I am one, uh, is really embodied in the Affordable Care Act as re with respect to, uh, to Medicare. Uh, and that is very appealing. It's, let's do everything we can to figure out how to make this better. Do lots of pilot programs, set up an innovation center, try everything we can, and then hire a bunch of experts to sift through the evidence and try to change uh, how Medicare actually operates, uh, change the incentives, uh, put out uh, uh, practice guidelines, uh, do, do whatever uh, seems necessary to get uh, more cost-effective uh, use of uh, the, the government's dollar. And then hope, and there's some evidence that this might happen, uh, that the private sector uh, picks uh, that, uh, that up. Uh, and the other way of looking at this, uh, much more favored by Republicans, is 
Uh, yes, try, try a lot of different things, not necessarily have the government do it, but have somebody do it, uh, and uh, hope that uh, comp a competitive uh, system uh, will get uh, more cost-effective care. Now, people used to talk about uh, hand out money and let people buy their own care. Uh, as though you were going to make the decision in which hospital to go to in the ambulance when you had a heart attack. Uh, but I think there's general view that that's not the way to go anymore, uh, uh, to go, but that people can make decisions among health plans if you give them enough uh, information about the outcomes of the plan, uh, what it covers, how, uh, and uh, what you're going to have to pay for it, and what the experience uh, has been. Uh, the extreme version of that approach uh, is uh, represented, was put into the Republican budget uh, in the House by Representative Ryan, uh, and uh, he uh, would uh, uh, end eventually, medic very slowly, uh, he would phase out Medicare uh, and uh, turn it into a program at which, uh, in which uh, people chose among plans and the government subsidy uh, was, uh, was capped. Um, I want to uh, put on the table a version of uh, Medicare reform that has come out of the Domenici Rivlin Task Force, but it's not the one in the book with which you may be familiar because we've been play, playing with it and working on it and trying to make it better uh, for uh, the last uh, several months. Uh, but we think it represents a good middle ground uh, be between the parties that might uh, end up being a compromise uh, position. Uh, we now call it defined support, uh, not premium support, because we think Paul Ryan, with good intentions, killed that one. Uh, uh, premiums, uh, but uh, defined support does uh, 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 capture, I think, uh, what it is. Uh, we would not get rid of fee-for-service Medicare. We would uh, preserve it, but give all seniors, after a date certain, uh, an option uh, to stay in fee-for-service Medicare or go uh, to a regional exchange and uh, purchase uh, uh, and choose among an array of uh, plans, health plans, uh, that would offer uh, the same, at a minimum, the same uh, Medicare uh, benefits. Uh, and uh, the government contribution uh, would be set uh, by competitive bidding in which both the fee-for-service system and the uh, comprehensive plans would engage and be set at uh, the second lowest uh, uh, bid uh, in, uh, in that uh, region. Uh, that means that uh, health care, the cost of delivering these services would be reflected, uh, but at a uh, competitive uh, rate. Uh, we think that would probably hold costs uh, down uh, quite a lot, but if it didn't, uh, if costs kept rising uh, very uh, rapidly, uh, we would cap the government contribution uh, as a fail-safe at uh, GDP, the growth of GDP uh, plus, uh, uh, plus one percent. We think this has a, a considerable number of uh, advantages. It does preserve uh, traditional Medicare, but it ensures its uh, solvency. Uh, we would ensure affordable premiums for low-income beneficiaries uh, if uh, the uh, 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 costs uh, did exceed uh, GDP plus one and uh, people were having to pay additional premiums. Those would be means tested. They would not be on uh, low-income people. Um, it does reflect uh, what it actually costs to deliver these, uh, these benefits, uh, but it responsibly ca uh, caps costs. Now, if, we, if all these experiments fail and we can't do anything uh, about, uh, about the cost uh, and uh, uh, the uh, cap is uh, uh, shifting uh, costs uh, rapidly onto uh, beneficiaries, then Congress has to decide what to do. Uh, and uh, from past history, uh, I don't think the decision will be 
uh, to hell with old people, uh, let's load all of the cost on them. There isn't a, uh, there isn't a uh, history of that. Uh, and uh, it uh, does uh, ensure continuity for, or probability of continuity for people who already have coverage as they approach 65, and for those people who under the Affordable Care Act are used to choosing on an exchange, uh, they get to do that again. So we think that's a possible compromise. We hope the Joint uh, Select Committee is looking at serious possibilities for compromise because, as I said at the beginning, we have to deal with this problem. Thank you. Thank you, Alice. Um, next, we're going to hear from uh, Dr. Bob Reischauer. Dr. Reischauer is currently the president of the Urban Institute. He's also one of the two public trustees for Social Security and Medicare, along with Chuck Blahouse, the other. Um, Dr. Ray Shower is also a former director of the Congressional Budget Office, so again, lots of budget expertise up here right now. Uh, he was also a member of the Medicare Payment Advisory Commission from 2000 to 2009, including its vice chair from 2001 to 2008. So a lot of knowledge, experience, both on budget, budget process, Medicare, health care. Uh, and again, we're very pleased and honored to have him here as well. So Dr. Reischauer. Okay, thank you. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to appear. Uh, in this forum and thank Jason and uh, Mercatus for sponsoring this event. Uh, I uh, don't have my Medicare Social Security public trustee hat on at this point, uh, so I might be more intemperate that, uh, than Alice uh, thought I might be. Uh, so uh, uh, that is just a word of warning. Um, you know, you've heard a million times that uh, the nation is on an unsustainable long-run fiscal path, and uh, you've been told twice already today, but I will add a third time, uh, that uh, to a large degree uh, the uh, unsustainability of our current path is attributable to the commitments the uh, federal government has made uh, with respect to its uh, health care programs, which are projected to grow quite rapidly over uh, the next decades. Uh, I use the word projected, uh, and you should uh, store it in the back of your heads, uh, because there's a huge amount of uncertainty that surrounds exactly what's going to happen uh, with respect to health care costs. Uh, the uncertainty is associated, in my mind, with at least uh, three factors. First of all, uh, we are at the uh, beginning of an IT genomic and nanotechnology revolution uh, that is going to transform healthcare uh, over the next 20 or 30 years in ways I don't think that anybody can predict. Cost increasing, cost reducing, health improving, undoubtedly. Uh, but, uh, you know, what the bottom line will be, no one knows. Uh, second, uh, the uncertainty comes from the very significant efforts that uh, private sector providers and payers uh, are engaged in to control costs. You know, we've had a lot of sort of movement around this area, uh, feel good, talk good, uh, over the last few decades. Uh, but I think by and large, if we go back to the 1990s uh, and earlier uh, in this century, um, a lot of it was talk and nobody really thought uh, it was going to happen. Uh, I think there's a fundamental change has occurred in the last uh, five or six years, and that is the provider community uh, and uh, the uh, payers are now convinced this is real, something has to happen, and so an awful lot is going on. And third, of course, uh, the uncertainty comes uh, from something all of you are quite familiar with, which is uh, the Affordable Care Act. Uh, we have a whole lot of things uh, in the Affordable Care Act that uh, um, might work, might hold down costs, might uh, transform uh, the sector, uh, or might not. I have uh, now, my mouth has run faster than my slides. Um, 
the, um, as you also know, uh, the growth of health care costs is not something that's confined to the federal government's programs. It is uh, <clears throat> uh, just as virulent in the uh, private sector, and uh, that has repercussions back onto the federal government because uh, much of private sector uh, health care costs are paid for by uh, employers uh, initially. Uh, that, economists believe, has led to a dampened growth of wages. Uh, the dampened growth of wages has uh, reduced the growth of federal tax revenues. Uh, and so uh, both sides of uh, this sector uh, are working to a disadvantage of our uh, long-term fiscal sustainability. Um, Medicare, uh, as you all know, is a huge program, 15% of total spending. Uh, it's going to get larger as we go forward. Uh, but uh, that doesn't appear to be the case if you look at just the next 10 years. And I think it's worth focusing on that because it does have some relevance for the super committee. Um, Medicare over the next 10 years is actually uh, going to rise at a quite modest pace by Medicare standards, about 5.9 percent a year aggregate. Now that uh, compares to 11.7 in the 80s, 7.2 in the 90s, and 9 percent in the last decade. So uh, you know this is really uh, quite slow. Uh, you can decompose that growth into uh, people, meaning beneficiaries and cost per beneficiary. As uh, Alice and others have mentioned, uh, we are about to go through an unprecedented expansion in the beneficiary population. If you just look at, these are annual rates of growth over decade-long periods. And in the decade that we have just gotten into, uh, it's going to be 3%, uh, which is two-thirds faster than the last decade and double the rate of uh, the 1980s. So this is uh, an expansion that uh, we have no uh, historical record of uh, previously. Uh, of course, there's very little that the uh, super committee can do about this. Uh, the, the baby boomers are here. The baby boomers have become, are becoming eligible uh, people. Uh, so uh, if we're talking about the 3% uh, there and the 2%, 0.4% in the next decade, uh, we're really talking about uh, baked into the cake, uh, not much you can do. Uh, what's uh, equally surprising, though, uh, is that uh, per beneficiary spending under current policies is going to be quite slow by historical standards. Uh, in the past decades, it's been anywhere from 6 to 10%, uh, and it's going to be 29 uh, in the coming decades already. This is before the super committee has uh, necessarily uh, done anything. Uh, you know, why is this the case? Uh, two things. Uh, one is the Affordable Care Act. A whole lot was done in the Affordable Care Act that will uh, hold down spending uh, during the next 10 years, uh, and then it will uh, slacken off. Uh, the second uh, factor is uh, Medicare's average age of beneficiary is going to get younger. In come the uh, baby boomers. Uh, they're healthier and they use less uh, in the way of medical services than those who are older, and that helps dampen the cost. But by the time we get to the next decade, that's beginning to wear off. In the third uh, decade, what we have is a whole lot of uh, old people. Uh, who are going to be uh, very expensive. Um, another interesting way of sort of looking at uh, this period that we're in now versus what went before uh, us and to realize how unusual the situation is now, which makes the super committee's challenge even uh, more difficult to fulfill, uh, is to look at this uh, set of numbers that uh, Mike Chernow and his colleagues uh, produced. You know, we have lots and lots of talk about uh, can we hold excess spending growth, meaning the uh, degree to which per beneficiary spending exceeds GDP,
per capita growth uh, down. And you know everybody is despaired, pulled their hair out on this one. Uh, but uh, what this chart shows you is for the next few years anyway, uh, the expectation is because of the Affordable Care Act, uh, we're going to be in a situation where per beneficiary spending grows slower than GDP. To be honest with you, a little bit of this is attributable to the uh, hope that the economy is going to recover, so GDP is going to grow faster. But uh, nevertheless, this is a very unusual situation that we're in right now. Now, um, the Super Committee uh, really faces three uh, different challenges in a way. Uh, and the first of those is to come up with some savings that will uh, sum to $1.2 trillion, not the $1.5 that is a goal, uh, but the $1.2 that is necessary to ensure that uh, there isn't a sequestration in 2013 in January and then subsequent uh, cuts after that. Um, and uh, the second is uh, to keep in focus uh, the fact that uh, what it really should be doing is looking at measures <coughs> that can affect the long run growth. We don't want to do a whole lot of things uh, that will dampen uh, Medicare growth over the next eight to 10 years only to find that uh, 2020, 2021, and beyond, uh, we're, we're deep in the hole. If we're going to take tough decisions, we should take them in ways that will generate dividends that grow over time. <clears throat> the third uh, challenge that uh, Super Committee is going to face is uh, coming up with some way to pay for the unavoidable uh, adjustment uh, that will be made to avoid uh, the 29% uh, uh, reduction in the physician fee schedule that is uh, uh, programmed under current law to go into effect uh, in January. You know, we've been in this, you know, uh, perils of Pauline situation uh, virtually every year for the last decade, uh, but we're in it uh, big time uh, uh, as of uh, January. Certainly other parts of Congress could grapple with this, but it would seem a little strange to have a super committee doing uh, the $1.2 trillion worth of deficit reduction and then somebody else, uh, some other committee structure or leadership group trying to come up with the money necessary. Uh, they both undoubtedly go to the same well and pull up the same bucket of water. Uh, so uh, that really has to be within the purview of, um, of the uh, super committee, I think. Uh, the important thing to remember is that it's not chump change that we need to uh, solve the SGR problem. Uh, if we're uh, talking, as some people would, about just throwing it in the can, saying no more doc fix, it was a noble experiment, uh, we couldn't keep up with it, so let's get rid of it. Then you're talking about uh, coming up with uh, something well over $300 billion over the next 10 years because the fee schedule would then be adjusted each year by what's called the Medicare Economic Index, which is an input price uh, measure uh, with an adjustment for uh, productivity. Uh, there are others who say, no, no, why don't we just freeze uh, doctor payment rates for the next 10 years? And that's a little bit under $300 billion. Or you could be Medic, MedPAC, and MedPAC's come up and said, well, you know, why don't we uh, cut specialist fees by 5.9% for three years in a row, and then freeze specialists, and freeze um, the uh, uh, primary care uh, fees where they are now, and that only costs you $200 billion. Uh, but you know, if you think about this, this is like 20, 25 percent of what the committee has to come up with uh, for its 1.2. So we're talking about it really looking at 125 percent of what the mandate was uh, for it to solve both of these problems together. Now, uh, there's really four places the committee can uh, look to to draw savings, beneficiaries, taxpayers, providers, 
and sort of the institutional structure that now uh, exists. And there are literally dozens of ideas, proposals, plans on the table. Alice talked about some of the more significant ones, uh, but uh, there are many ideas available in the Bowles Simpson uh, proposal, in the Diminishy Rivlin one, Gang of Six, the Biden Group, the MedPAC uh, list of uh, proposals, and uh, many others. Uh, and let me just uh, touch on uh, some aspects of uh, each of these four food groups. Um, with respect to beneficiaries, uh, you know, we can always increase the premiums that uh, beneficiaries pay for uh, Part B and Part uh, D services. Uh, when Medicare started, uh, the Part B premium was equal to 50% of the cost. It's now at about 25% uh, of uh, Part B cost and, and legislated to uh, remain there. It, the, the Part B and Part D premiums already are uh, income related. So the question of, you know, should we uh, do more to raise the premiums paid by upper income people uh, or raise everybody's premiums? Uh, I think the Ministry Rivlin uh, wanted to bring the 25% up to 35%. In other words, it would affect everybody. The president has put a plan on the table uh, to increase uh, the uh, amounts paid by upper income people. Uh, we now uh, really affect a relatively small, less than 10% of beneficiaries pay these income related premiums. But some of them, for some of them, is pretty steep. Uh, the uh, regular premium amounts to roughly uh, $1,100 a year for a Part B beneficiary. If your income was over $214,000, you'd be paying 80% of the total cost, which is about $4,400 a year. Uh, President wants to up these a little and expand uh, over time uh, who is uh, affected by them. Uh, second way to go is to uh, uh, put an excise tax on uh, particularly generous Medigap coverage. Medigap is uh, private insurance provided either by an employer or a uh, uh, private insurance company which wraps around Medicare and uh, tends to pay for your deductibles, your coinsurance, uh, and costs not picked up. Uh, it has long been uh, shown that those who have this insurance uh, utilize services at a much higher level imposing costs on Medicare. And so the idea is, well, maybe we should uh, 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 recoup uh, that inducement effect uh, and uh, get it back. Many of the proposals that people suggest have that as a component. Uh, the president has uh, included that in his list as well. We could uh, increase uh, deductibles uh, and rationalize and increase uh, coinsurance in this program, also affecting uh, beneficiaries. Um, the uh, uh, current uh, Part B deductible is $162. There are many proposals that would raise a combined deductible for hospital insurance and Part B to somewhere between $500 and uh, uh, $600 uh, a year. Uh, the uh, president has uh, made a modest suggestion uh, in this way. If we want to go more radical, uh, we could reduce the number of services that are offered. Um, the, uh, uh, that would, uh, would and is uh, hugely uh, controversial. Uh, you know, what we'd have to do is uh, more stringently apply uh, tests of effectiveness. Uh, right now, the vast majority of American people seem to think that uh, the system should cover anything that has been proven uh, not to be harmful. Uh, and the idea that we would test and see is it beneficial uh, is a radical suggestion. Uh, but one, at some point, this country is going to have to face. Other countries have decades ago. And uh, the uh, result is their life expectancy is longer than ours. Uh, but I wouldn't draw any conclusion from that. Um, 
We could reduce the number of beneficiaries, but as I said before, uh, this is sort of long-term, uh, not short-term. Some of the proposals were to increase the age of eligibility from uh, 65 up to 67, uh, <coughs> and uh, that uh, is a very complicated issue uh, with many different kinds of ramifications. It would cause people to stay in the labor force longer, uh, which would be good for the economy, maybe good for their health. Uh, it would increase uh, the out-of-pocket burden they have for health care uh, very significantly uh, in uh, two-thirds of the cases. Uh, One-third of these individuals would actually see uh, lower expenses because they would largely be in the exchange uh, with uh, generous subsidies. So there's lots of forces moving uh, in various uh, different directions. With respect to all of these kinds of things, uh, what should you keep in mind? Well, one thing is that uh, some of them, like changing the cost of insurance uh, or premiums, uh, affect everybody, uh, whether you're sick or whether you're well. Others of them will only affect uh, you if you're sick, and so you have to make a fundamental uh, choice on, you know, who do we who do we want to hit if you uh, go these ways. Um, it's worth remembering that there's probably not a lot of juice to be found uh, in this fruit because the vast uh, bulk of uh, Medicare recipients are uh, of quite modest means. Forty-seven percent have incomes below two hundred percent of poverty. Uh, the numbers that are up there in the stratosphere who could pay significant amounts of income-related premiums uh, are, uh, are, is not large. Um, the uh, other thing to remember is, uh, unlike younger people, uh, older people, retirees, have much less ability to restructure their lives to accommodate uh, changes like this, and that's why uh, most uh, lawmakers want to phase these things in rather gradually. Uh, moving on, uh, what about uh, the taxpayer? And here I'll just uh, say only a word about uh, the uh, HI payroll tax. Uh, it's a tax that uh, has no limit in the sense it's 1.45 on employer and employee. Uh, as far as the eye can see, unlike Social Security, the Affordable Care Act uh, raised by nine-tenths of a percentage point. Uh, this tax on individuals with wage earnings over uh, um, $200,000 uh, and uh, also imposed a 3.8% uh, tax on unearned income. Uh, so there are already some changes that are going to take place in 2013 uh, in this food group and uh, the tolerance for more there uh, might be quite limited. Um, how about the uh, time-tested uh, route of whacking providers, uh, which uh, is uh, where we've uh, achieved most of our savings over uh, the decades in the past. Um, there are lots of uh, ways, obviously, of doing this. Uh, you can... Uh, you know, whack everybody or just whack selected ones. Uh, it's very appealing uh, to lawmakers because it's largely invisible to beneficiaries. Uh, they don't know you're paying the hospital less, uh, so, you know, what's there to worry about? Um, the uh, lawmakers also uh, realize that many providers, particularly large institutional ones, uh, have an ability to... Uh, to uh, react, uh, they can seek efficiencies, uh, as many have done, uh, or they can shift uh, costs onto other payers. Uh, and uh, so, so the ramifications may not be as catastrophic as uh, sometimes uh, we think. But on the other hand, it's worth uh, noting that there are institutions, hospitals, nursing homes, uh, uh, others uh, that are heavily dependent on Medicare and Medicaid business, uh, and they don't have a place to go for this. 
uh, and so you uh, run a uh, significant risk uh, that you're going to destabilize the provider community in those areas particularly uh, that you uh, care most about uh, providing uh, adequate uh, access. Finally, um, if I add my druthers, and I think from Alice's her remarks, uh, she would uh, go here too. Uh, the food group that uh, policymakers should focus on the most is the savings that uh, we might make that uh, promise to transform the delivery system uh, into a more efficient one. Uh, this is the only way we're going to uh, get out of this problem when we talk about uh, something in the long run. The Affordable Care Act had lots of um, uh, modest uh, sort of uh, dips into this uh, water. Uh, we don't know how many of them are going to pan out uh, but uh, uh, or how long they're going to take. There are lots of uh, pilots, demonstrations, and so on. Having uh, been nine years on uh, MedPAC, uh, my reaction uh, always is it takes, uh, you know, two years to set the demonstration up, three years to run it, a year and a half to evaluate it afterwards, and then the report comes and it says, it depends. Uh, <laughs> in some circumstances, this works. In other circumstances, it doesn't. We need another demonstration. Uh, there are those who say, look, all this is so uncertain, we should just jump in uh, fully and uh, try uh, to manage the consequences uh, as we go. Some of these are, uh, you know, quite modest. Uh, we're going to uh, penalize um, uh, hospitals for excessive readmission rates. Uh, there are countries in Europe who don't pay for any readmission. Uh, you know, uh, we could uh, change things like this uh, much, much faster and to a much greater extent. I mean, when you have a risk-adjusted um, readmission rate of, uh, let's say, 22 percent, and the average for the uh, industry is 12, uh, and that uh, particular institution has been in the 20s year after year after year, uh, the way to get their board's attention is to just say, you know, we're not paying. Uh, and uh, you will be surprised how quickly their uh, performance will improve. Uh, and if it doesn't, you know, there's a real question on whether you should be encouraging uh, the people that you are responsible for to uh, participate in this. Um, these kinds of changes, however, uh, are the most threatening to the existing stakeholders, uh, and they're the most difficult for the CBO to score. And so there's a natural tendency for uh, lawmakers to shy away from them. Uh, understandable, to be sure. But the question is, can we do that in the circumstances uh, we find ourselves in today? Uh, let me just close by saying that uh, should the sequestration uh, go through, uh, Medicare will be uh, cut by 2%. Uh, from 2013 to the end of the decade. It will be a reduction of a total of about $123 billion. I would be very surprised uh, if uh, the resolution of uh, this involves a smaller number than that. In other words, uh, I think that's the floor uh, for the kind of cuts that Medicare is going to experience. And the real question is, are we going to do them in a stupid way uh, with the meat acts, uh, or are we going to more sensibly allocate them across some of these uh, uh, policies uh, that can help us over the long run rather than just uh, providing some uh, short run solace? Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Um, we're also going to take questions after the last speaker, which is uh, Chuck Blahaus. 
And Chuck Blahaus is also a senior research fellow uh, at the Mercatus Center with me. He's also the second of the public trustees for Social Security and Medicare. Um, Chuck served as the deputy director for President Bush's National Economic Council. He was also the executive director of the bipartisan President's Commission to Strengthen Social Security. He has several books and writings. Uh, the most recent is the unfinished, uh, Social Security, The Unfinished Work. And I'd like to point out, um, while Dr. Reischauer and Dr. Rivlin have their PhDs in economics, and I have mine in public policy, Chuck's a little different. Chuck has his PhD from the University of California at Berkeley in computational quantum chemistry. He does not look like a chemist to me, uh, but we're happy here to have him. He's very knowledgeable on Social Security, on Medicare, uh, and budget as well. So without further ado, Chuck Blahaus. That's, uh, that's what is known as being unqualified. But let me, uh, uh, this is somebody else's PowerPoint. No, no, click so the next one. Can we get to, aha, there we are, okay. Uh, let me just begin by saying that uh, unlike Alice, I think I, I will have to be a little bit shy today. Uh, my, my degree of reticence will be comparable to that of my fellow trustee, uh, Bob Reischauer. Um, uh, various personal circumstances have kept me from being as helpful to the uh, Joint Budget Committee as I would normally like to be. Uh, the last thing that I want to do today is to say anything that makes uh, their very difficult job harder than it already is. So what I'd like to do is uh, walk you all through a little bit of the substantive background of Social Security that the Joint Budget Committee would have to deal with if they took it on, and then in a somewhat agnostic way talk about um, the arguments for and against the committee taking on Social Security and the sorts of uh, scorekeeping metrics that will come into play uh, if the committee decides to take it on. This chart, this graph, is straight out of the trustees report and if you had to pick one picture from the trustees report that tells you almost everything you need to know about what the trustees report says about system finances, uh, this would probably be it. Uh, almost everything that is relevant to the projections for Social Security is somewhere on this chart. Uh, overall, the chart is expressed uh, with everything as a percentage of taxable worker wages. So you can think of this as the toll that the program takes uh, in terms of the tax bite it takes out of worker wages and how costs compare to uh, the wage base uh, on which uh, Social Security revenues are uh, assessed. Um, as you can see in the picture, the bold line is rising very, very dramatically up through the 2030s, and there it flattens out. And basically what that represents is the growth of system costs that will occur in the future because of the fact that the baby boomers are heading onto the retirement rolls. Uh, now, if it weren't for the Great Recession, uh, you would see a pretty steady, uninterrupted curve of cost increases from about 2008 through 2035 and that would be entirely driven by demographics. That would be the baby boomers. Now what happened in 2009 is we got a bit of an acceleration of that. We got a spike upward in costs because what happened is that the recession depressed incoming revenues, so it depressed the underlying base, and at the same time you had a bit of a spike in costs because uh, disability claims went up as they always uh, do during a recession. Uh, and early retirement benefit claims went up a little bit relative to previous projections. Uh, so as a percentage of the underlying base, we had a spike upwards in, in costs in 2009. If it weren't for that, uh, then you would see a pretty steady, uninterrupted growth in costs up through the mid-2030s, uh, beginning with the first retirements of the baby boomers in 2008. The other thing that you can see on this graph is what's happening with the trust fund. Uh, we show that in the mid-2030s, uh, 2036, the combined Social Security trust funds would be depleted. And there you see a gap between the scheduled benefit formula and the resources the program will have on hand to pay benefits. And the gap at that point uh, would only leave the program with enough resources to pay 77% of scheduled benefits. Now, on this uh, slide, I've put together just a few summary facts and figures that are prominent in the trustees' reports. As I said before, the combined trust fund exhaustion date for Social Security is 2036. Uh, but you have to remember, Social Security has two trust funds. It has the OASI trust fund, which is what people think of as the retirement trust fund. That's old age and survivor's insurance. And you have the disability insurance trust fund. 
The Disability Insurance Trust Fund is in much worse shape. That program, uh, that trust fund is scheduled to be depleted in 2018. Now, we also show what I would call the nightmare scenario. We put the facts and figures in the report that show just what would be the terrible choices in 2036 if we actually waited that long to fix the problem. Now, this doesn't mean that we as trustees think that Congress would or should wait until 2036 to fix this. Uh, if you did wait until then, your choices would be so unpalatable as, as I would say to be ridiculous. You'd either have to cut benefits 23% across the board, or you would have to have a sudden increase in the payroll tax rate to 16.4%. Uh, either of these would be uh, sudden actions taken far, far more severely and suddenly than uh, w w there is any political precedent for. But nevertheless, we show them by way of illustration in the trustees report. Uh, another thing I'd point out from this slide is that uh, the trust fund ratio is already in decline. Uh, and occasionally I will hear it said that uh, we don't really have a big concern in Social Security because after all the nominal balance of the trust funds is currently continuing to rise for various reasons. <laughs> and it's important to bear in mind that that's really not terribly meaningful. Uh, pretty much everything rises in nominal terms just because of inflation, because of a lot of things. To say that something is rising in nominal terms doesn't really tell you a whole lot. Uh, what really matters in terms of the purchasing power of the trust fund is how long, if you had to rely on the trust fund, uh, how long it would be the duration of benefits that it could finance. That's already in decline. That started in 2008. And the reason, of course, that it's in decline is that the cost of paying benefits is rising faster than the nominal balance of the trust fund. So the fact that the nominal balance of the trust funds is still rising uh, is, is much less significant than the fact that its purchasing power is already in decline. Now, in the trustees' messages, uh, we try to insert a few summary points that readers should bear in mind uh, if they find it uh, forbidding and very unpleasant to wade through 275 pages of the trustees' report, as most people do. Uh, so I've just selected three of these. Um, we, we try to make the point that uh, it's really important that we get this done soon. This is not just an abstract concern. Every year that we wait, our choices become much more difficult. Uh, and we're going to have much more severe adverse consequences, probably for some vulnerable populations, either because they're already in retirement uh, or because they're low-income people. But the longer we wait, the worse our choices get. The second point, don't get distracted too much by this ongoing, almost theological discussion about the trust fund and what it means and what it doesn't mean. Uh, there's a lot of different perspectives and controversies on the trust funds. And I find that when I testify, uh, or make any sort of public appearance, I usually get questions from both directions about what the trust fund really means. And one side will say, isn't it true that it's full faith and credit of the U.S. government and a real asset to Social Security? And I'll say yes. And the other side will say, well, isn't it true that from the overall taxpayer perspective and the overall unified budget perspective, it's not a net asset? And I have to say yes. Uh, but the point is that even though different sides can stress different aspects of the trust fund, you always have to come back to the same conclusion, which is that we have to deal with Social Security. So whether you look at Social Security from a trust fund perspective or from a unified budget perspective, you still come back to the same place. All reform proposals honor the bonds in the trust fund, uh, so it's not really a question of whether or not this affects the magnitude of the solutions that we ultimately uh, uh, implement. The fact is, no matter how you look at the trust fund, you have the same conclusion, we have to deal with this. And the last uh, point that I would emphasize is that while we can show you certain illustrative costs of delay, and we do, uh, in many practical respects, these understate the real costs of delay because of political and policy constraints. I can show a senator or a congressman, look, in 2036, you would have to cut benefits 23% across the board. Now, of course, any legislator is going to look at that and they're going to say, well, I don't want to cut 20 benefits 23% across the board. In fact, I don't want to cut benefits for people already in retirement at all. Historically, we've always wanted to make benefit changes prospectively, uh, with the exception of the occasional maybe COLA delay or adjustment here or there in the past. For the most part, any changes we want to make in benefits, we want to do affecting future retirees, not people already on the rolls. And so if you say, well, what happens in 2036 if we want to make benefit changes prospective only? Well, in that year, even if you cut off 100% of the benefits to the new retiree class, you still wouldn't be in balance, even with a significant tax increase. So you have to start working through the problem backwards and say, well, how soon do we have to act to be able to work within the bounds of what our political system finds tolerable? Uh, that window is closing in just the next couple of years. Now let me just walk through a couple of facts and figures as the Joint Budget Committee might um, encounter if they were to deal with Social Security. Um, the, the program 
This year is scheduled to, to spend about $738 billion in, uh, it's mostly benefit payments, sm very, very small amount of administrative expenses. Uh, the amount of tax, payroll tax revenue the program is going to bring in uh, is about $565 billion, and there's a little bit more money coming in from benefit taxation. So altogether, the program is generating about $587 billion in tax revenue this year. So if you wanted to look at the program from a unified budget perspective, not everyone will want to take that perspective, but if you wanted to just ask the question, what is this program's effect on the unified federal budget, the answer is that it's adding about $151 billion to our deficit this year. The expenditures are that much in excess of the tax income that it is generating. Now, as Jason alluded to earlier, uh, there is some additional revenue being provided to the trust fund from other government accounts. Uh, when the payroll tax was cut, uh, there was a provision inserted in the law that said we're going to transfer revenues over from the general fund side of the budget into the Social Security Trust Fund. Now, that revenue is not revenue coming into the U.S. Treasury, so it has no unified budget significance, but it does add to the trust fund. So if you were to say, uh, what is the Social Security system's total non-interest income this year? It's about $693 billion. And if you were to say, what is the deficit of its non-interest income relative to expenditures? That would be about $46 billion. And of course, the trust fund does earn interest on the bonds. That's about $115 billion this year. You add it all up, you have about $808 billion of income coming to the trust fund, which means that the trust fund balance is going to rise by about $69 billion this year even as the program is adding $151 billion to the unified budget deficit. So we're in this very sort of odd period right now where the program is a big draw of the general budget at the same time that its own trust fund is actually rising in value. Now the question of whether the Joint Committee should uh, take on Social Security reform is one where I'm, I'm going to try to be very scrupulously agnostic uh, today. Um, again, uh, their job is tough enough without me telling them you really need to do this, you really need not to do that. So let me just give some of the arguments for and against. Uh, the arguments for, obviously, uh, Social Security has a big shortfall, substantial shortfall, and we have to deal with it. Uh, it requires legislative correction. It's not going to go away uh, by itself. Uh, secondly, despite some myth-making to the contrary, this is a big part of our overall federal deficit problem. It's a very significant contributor to the unified federal deficit this year. It's going to be an even bigger contributor to it in the future. Uh, this is the most expensive federal program there is, uh, and even though, as my colleagues noted, over the long term, health care is the bigger driver of uh, federal spending growth, the fact is that in the aggregate, not as a percentage growth rate, but in the aggregate, Social Security growth is actually projected over the next 15 years to be even more than Medicare growth. So this is not an insignificant issue as far as the federal deficit is concerned. Um, third, uh, as I indicated before, the longer we delay a solution, the worse it's going to be. And you tell me when our next big opportunity is going to be to deal with this. I'm, I'm skeptical that we are going to be here in this room in August 2012 talking about the impending action of the Congress to fix Social Security on a bipartisan basis. Uh, so if this joint committee doesn't take it on, I honestly don't know when the next opportunity is going to be. Uh, that's, uh, that would be an argument for this committee do dealing with it. And of course, uh, many people are of the view that one of the drags on our economy is that uh, there is great uncertainty as to how the government is going to get its fiscal house in order, and dealing with Social Security would remove a very significant source of that policy uncertainty. Now, having said that, there are certainly reasonable arguments on the other side as well. For example, one of the things the Joint Committee is bound to do is to evaluate reforms, at least in part, uh, by their effect on uh, the 10-year deficit outlook. They have to take a 10-year scoring view of a lot of what they put together. And I, uh, many people would say, well, this is not the best yardstick for Social Security reform. It's a long-term program. We generally think about how do we balance its books over the long term. We shouldn't be thinking of it in terms of what can it contribute to a 10-year improvement in the outlook. Uh, secondly, even though Social Security is unequivocally a contributor to our budget deficit problem, that doesn't necessarily mean that you should deal with it in the context of a uh, unified budget negotiation. Uh, the program needs to be balanced within its own bubble and uh, on its own terms. And uh, some might argue that it is a distortion of that process to say, well, let's, let's arrive at that solution based in part on what we want to have happening in the unified federal budget uh, rather than solely through the prism of Social Security's own uh, lens. And then finally, of course, uh, it's, it's hard, and this committee is a very difficult job, and taking this on would, of course, make uh, uh, the task even more ambitious. Now, 
I think it's worth noting that the Budget Committee has been given uh, some different charges. One of them is to produce a certain amount of deficit reduction over the next 10 years, and that's an important yardstick that is going to affect everything they look at. Uh, they've also been given another charge, which is to uh, make recommendations to improve the long-term fiscal imbalance of the federal government. Now, more typically, when you talk about Social Security reform, people are talking about it with respect to the second criterion. They say Social Security reform is generally important because it helps repair our long-term budget outlook. It's not as typical, at least in recent years, to say the reason to deal with Social Security reform is because of what's happening over the next 10 years. Having said that, it is not unprecedented to take a very close look at the effects of Social Security reforms over the upcoming 10 years. If you look at what happened in 1983, for example, they did put together a solution that was aiming at solvency over 75 years, but there was extremely close attention given to the year-by-year -year effects over the five to 10-year window. Um, it, they were very concerned about the program remaining in balance, not having to come back to the bargaining table uh, a few years later if the projections turned out to be wrong. And so uh, throughout that process, every time a table was produced for the Greenspan Commission or for the committees, uh, of jurisdiction, they would show not only what was happening over 75 years, but what was happening over the first five to 10 years, year by year. So it's certainly not unprecedented for Social Security reforms to be evaluated with respect to exactly what they would do over the next 10 years. Now, the question is, given that the Budget Committee does have to at least consider this 10-year window, I thought I might add some value to this discussion by talking about how the usual grab bag of Social Security reform proposals uh, is affected by that uh, yardstick. For example, some reforms uh, will get a relative scoring advantage compared to others if you look at them through the 10-year window. Uh, one example uh, would be, say, CPI reform. CPI reform among the changes you might make that could affect benefit outlays is one of the very, very few that is talked about that would have any impact on uh, outlays going out to people who are on the rolls already. So if you were to say, um, relative to a 75-year view, if you looked at the rest of the benefit changes we might consider, CPI reform might move up in the pipeline if you're saying, what's going to get us savings in that first 10 years? Um, Raising the cap on tax wages is another one that, that probably moves up in the pipeline if you take a 10-year view. Uh, assuming that we continue the connection between benefits and contributions in Social Security, what happens when you raise the cap on tax wages is you bring in revenue up front. Uh, over the long term, you obligate some additional benefit outlays, but you get the revenue first and the other benefit outlays come later. So if you look at this over the first 10 years, you see a, a, a big scoring advantage. If you look at it in, say, the 75th year, you see a smaller one. Uh, in a similar vein, um, raising the early eligibility age. If you were to go to the Social Security actuaries and say, uh, I want to raise the Social Security early eligibility age, uh, will I get much in the way of savings? They'll actually tell you no over the long term. Now, I don't think that necessarily is a complete analysis, but the reason they will arrive at that conclusion is that if people delay their retirements, they'll have less of an actuarial penalty when they claim their benefits. So from, the, from a benefit outlay perspective, it should roughly come out in the wash over the long term. Now, if you look at the first 10 years, if you raise the early eligibility age, some people who would have retired in 2020 are going to have to retire in 2022, and so you're going to see some savings within that 10-year period that you might not see if you took a longer view. So let, let me, the only reason I mention this is that if for other policy reasons you thought CPI reform made sense, if you thought raising the early eligibility age made sense, if you thought raising the cap on taxable wages made sense for other policy reasons, you might say, hey, this committee would be a pretty darn good place to do Social Security reform because those reforms would probably get a slight leg up in the evaluation. Now, other reforms are just the opposite. Suppose you're a person who thinks we need to re-index the benefit formula. Uh, you think that the initial benefit formula for benefits paid to new retirees should be pegged to prices rather than wages or, or, or partial price indexing, a blend of wage indexation and price indexation. Over the long term, that produces a ton of savings. Uh, but in the near term, it doesn't produce as much because it, it only affects benefit payments to new retirees. There's a very small wedge up front. It compounds and compounds and compounds over time, but you don't get much of that credit in the first 10 years. You get a ton of it in years 60 and 70. Uh, now, if you were someone who wanted to do some fundamental transformation of Social Security, if you wanted to shift to a personal account system or if you wanted to start investing the, the trust fund and other securities, 
Uh, that's going to look terrible in the first 10 years because that's when you're going to have your transition period. You're going to be taking revenue off the federal ledger. You might be able to say, well, we're going to get benefits later, but a 10-year view of the program is going to be very much against that sort of view. So if you're the sort of person that says, I want a fundamental change to Social Security or I want to re-annex the benefit formula, you probably don't want this committee to deal, to deal with it. And finally, I, I see some reforms as neither particularly advantaged nor disadvantaged by the 10-year view. Changes to the normal retirement age it really depends on the schedule that you phase it in. Changes to the benefit formula factors like the Simpson-Bowles Commission put together. There's a lot of different proposals to do uh, different forms of these, and it really just depends on the phase-in schedule. I, I don't see the metric as being particularly important. Uh, and let me just show you a couple of charts as examples of what I mean. If you look at this chart, this shows the effects of, of phasing in an increase in the cap on taxable wages. Uh, you can see what that does is that moves the revenue line up from the current law revenue line, which is that thick dotted blue line on the bottom. Uh, by raising the cap on taxable wages, we bring in more tax revenue. Uh, that goes up to a thick black line just above it. In the long run, you can see you actually obligate a little bit more in benefit outlays. Uh, the, the current law dotted uh, light blue line up near the top uh, would move up slightly. And you can see that over the very long term, we don't make a whole lot of progress in closing that imbalance in the 75th year. But if you look at the first 10 years, it's all savings. So that reform is going to look pretty good in the first 10 years. If you were to look at, say, progressive price indexing, the next chart, um, you can see progressive price indexing down the line produces a huge amount of savings. You can see how that, that small uh, dot, dotted uh, blue line at the very top, which is cost under current law, uh, would, would be bent completely back downward. And by the end, uh, you'd completely resolve the imbalance in uh, annual income and expenditures. But in the first 10 years, you get almost very little savings at all. Um, now, let me, now that I've given you just what I, I think, I hope, is a somewhat neutral rendition of of the arguments back and forth and which reforms might be advantaged or disadvantaged uh, by the scoring rules of the committee, uh, I'm going to weaken and I'm going to give you a couple of subjective <laughs> personal opinions. Um, these are not trustees' opinions, I hasten to say, but uh, uh, I'll give you three. The first is that CPI reform, in my judgment, is a technical, broader budget reform. I was, I was chagrined when I read earlier this year when people were saying that uh, the administration was putting Social Security benefit cuts on the table by talking about CPI reform or that the, somehow this is some fundamental Social Security reform. I, I, I don't think that's the right way to think about it. The way I, I look at it, uh, the clear statutory intent of inflation indexation is to model inflation as accurately as possible. Whether we're talking about the income tax code, whether we're talking about Social Security colas, that's the clear statutory intent. Um, and so if we uh, were to conclude that the consumer price index that we're now using is not the most accurate one, then we ought to go to a new one. And we should do it across the board. I understand that this increases tax revenues. I understand that this would change Social Security colas. But um, my view is that uh, as much as I, as a Republican and a conservative, would like to see lower tax rates, I don't think, that I don't think the job of uh, holding down tax rates should be done by uh, over-indexing for inflation. And similarly, while I appreciate the distributional concerns that some might raise about uh, Social Security colas and their effects on the, on the elderly, I, my view is that distributional concerns should be dealt with through the benefit formula. We should get our inflation right. We should get it right across the board. It's a technical change. It's an appropriate change. And it's not Social Security reform. Um, second view is that I think that if the committee delves into Social Security reform, they would do well to try to approach it uh, from the angle of the reforms that are the least polarized and the least politicized. Over the years, there's been a lot of things that people have been, talked, have been talking about, from raising the, the, the cap on taxable wages, to price indexing, to personal accounts, to all these other things. And, and people on different sides of the aisle have had to choose up sides on these things. And it makes it tough for people to change their views about it. Uh, but I think there is a grab bag of things that the parties haven't hardened on. Uh, there are a lot of reforms that could be made to how the benefit formula works uh, to better strengthen the connection between uh, work contributions and benefits received for those contributions. Uh, I list a, a bunch of them here. I won't go into the details, but everything from the basic formula to the actuarial adjustments for early and delayed retirement to the way the non-working spouse benefit is constructed uh, to the earnings limitation, these are all things I think that could be reformed, produce some savings, improve work incentives, and not get into the territory that has been the most uh, politically hazardous. And then finally, uh, I think we should tread very carefully with this idea of continuing to cut the payroll tax. Remember, the Social Security payroll tax 
is, for better or worse, the lifeblood of Social Security. This is where its revenue comes from. Uh, if we continue to cut into it, and again, I'm a Republican, I'm a conservative, I like low taxes, uh, but uh, on this, I find myself uh, somewhat sympathizing with the views expressed by 61 House Democrats when they say this is a dangerous thing to be doing. Uh, there's only two things that can happen if we cut Social Security's payroll taxes. Either we hasten the program's insolvency, or we have to fill in the gap by funding the program with general revenues, basically income taxes. I think they're both very dangerous for Social Security. Either you're directly um, hastening the program's financial problems, or uh, you're propping up the program with general revenues, and I think changing something very fundamental about the program and the way uh, the public has been led to believe that this is a self-financing program, not a welfare program, uh, not a program that's being subsidized through the back door through the, uh, the general treasury. So uh, I urge caution on that. And with that, I'm done. Thank you. We are going to take questions. I appreciate you guys sticking around. But before we start with questions, I want to give a round of applause to all the panelists for being here today. Thank you for their time. So we do have a microphone. So if someone raises their hand and gives their name and affiliation, that'd be fantastic. Hey, Chris Jacobs with the Republican Policy Committee. Um, I actually don't have an entitlement question so much as an untitlement question. <laughs> Um, revol involving the Class Act, um, which the administration now said they're not going to go forward in implementing. And I know, Dr. Rivlin, you and the Fiscal Commission have outlined concerns. And my question is to Dr. Rivlin and Dr. Reischauer as, as two former CBO directors. Since 2009, experts have been saying that classes insolvency was either pro possible, probable, likely, or certain, depending upon who you asked. CBO has pr previously discounted when they, in, in their budget scorekeeping conventions, they discount budgetary savings from proposed rules due to political uncertainty. They've also done a matter of probabilistic scoring of certain one-sided bets on ag subsidies and other things. They've scored IPAB that way now to reflect the uncertainty and, and the po possibility. My question is, is it right that CBO scored 100 credited PPACA with 100% of the savings from class, even though even back in 2009 we knew there was more than a 0% possibility that the program wouldn't go forward. And then secondly, kind of related, how do we get around this? Is this a, a potential gimmick that I, I know I'm concerned and, and Senator Thune has done budget reform, is concerned that how do we avoid, you know, kind of manipulating the system of the scorekeeping of possibilities there? Bob may have a more detailed answer to this than I have, but uh, my impression was uh, CBO has to score according to current law. It was in the law. Uh, and what was in the law was that it uh, collected premiums up front and uh, uh, the bulk of the, the uh, uh, benefits were way out there. Uh, a lot of us didn't think it was a workable program, but CBO can't make a judgment about that. They had to say, here's the law, and it actually collects benefits uh, in the near term and pays them out later. Um, you know, it strikes me there are two issues here. Uh, some people looked at the Class Act and said, you know, long run, this is non-viable for political reasons. You'll never uh, get the benefit reduced if the premiums coming in aren't sufficient as required by law. And, you know, that's a political judgment. CBO shouldn't be in that at all. Uh, there's another issue, which is an actuarial issue, and that is whether, given the constraints that were in the legislation, you could devise a uh, benefit and premium that met those constraints and people came forward and signed up in sufficient numbers to make it a viable program. And I think the HHS study was on the second of those issues, which, uh, you know, took three panels of actuaries, you know, long uh, sets of meetings to arrive at that conclusion. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I don't think uh, CBO 
will ever have the capability of doing something like that in the real time that is required uh, to come up with uh, an estimate. So I, I wouldn't fault CBO on this at all. Yes, sir. I'm Darren Thacker with Congressman Wally Herger's office. Uh, my boss chairs the Ways and Means Subcommittee on Health. And I was just wanting to get maybe Dr. Reichauer's uh, response to Dr. Rivlin's revised proposal on Medicare reform. I, I know in your presentation you mentioned premium support um, as a possibility, and I know your um, previous support, if, if you will, of certain aspects of that or concepts of that. So you have Dr. Rivlin uh, proposing essentially something that puts Medicare traditional Medicare in direct competition with private plans and through an annual competitive bidding process. I think she said the benchmark would be determined based on the second lowest bid. Of course, Bro Thomas Commission, I think, did the average bid or you could do minimum bid. I just see this as being a really good opportunity for the compromise approach that Dr. Rivlin spoke of. Heritage Foundation, AEI, this commission, all suggesting something in that direction. So just from more of a center left, I guess, think tank world, is that something you could support the, the, the plan that Dr. Rivlin <coughs> discussed? <laughs> yeah, my, my he, former boss. He hasn't seen the revised mentor, version. I haven't seen this, so I'm not going to sign on to anything. <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> let me uh, say, having been uh, responsible with Henry Aaron for coining the term premium support, uh, that uh, I have, am still a supporter of premium support uh, with lots of uh, restraints and limitations on it. The difference between premium support and some of these other plans, I think including what Alice is proposing where she has put a budget of GDP plus one, uh, uh, a budget limit, uh, is that premium support said that the subsidy provided by the government uh, to beneficiaries will grow at the same rate that health care costs grow uh, in the economy as a whole, or something at some rate that's associated with the growth of health care costs. Uh, so what it suggests is you've got to go out there and do something about health care costs, as opposed to a Ryan plan, which says we're going to adjust this every year by the CPI or some index that has nothing to do with or very little to do with health. So that makes a fundamentally different kind of, uh, uh, you know, animal in terms of its uh, uh, long-run uh, uh, potential. Uh, so, you know, I, I haven't seen the detail of uh, Alice's new uh, proposal, but my guess is uh, I'd want to put enough bells and whistles on it so it would move more towards our original uh, 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 proposal. But, uh, you know, in our, in Henry's and my original proposal, we had uh, the um, traditional Medicare competing. Uh, so, you know, the, the danger there is that uh, it's not a fair competition, that uh, uh, the political system uh, advantages uh, traditional Medicare in the competition. And, uh, you know, I would want all sorts of uh, yeah, restraints yeah. to ensure that that would not be the right. case. Other questions? Thank you. Up front here, Maggie. Um, my name is Maggie. I work for Congressman Louis Gohmert from Texas. I've worked with Jason quite a bit. Um, and I, I would like to flush out the payroll tax issue a little bit more. I don't know if you're familiar with Ross Kaminsky of American Spectator. Um, he wrote an article that said that this payroll tax concept is, is a trap. Um, and my question would be, why are we not focusing on the main issue, which Dr. Rivlin mentioned? Is a, the real problem here is a, the ratio. We started with 44 workers to one retiree, and now it's three to one, soon to be two to one. Why don't we highlight that? And is there ultimately always going to be an aversion to moving to personalized accounts? You've got some of the most socialist countries in the, in the world, Sweden, Chile, they've all moved to, to personalize private accounts. Why can't we do that? I'll, I'll give a two-part answer to that. I, uh, first of all, I, I totally agree on the demographic point. I think this is all about demographics. Uh, certainly every time I talk about Social Security, I try to point out that the, uh, the 
cost growth in the system is it's entirely demographic phenomenon. And um, you know, costs in the 2030s are going to be enormous because of the, the demographics and all the baby boomers. And even if the payroll tax is still technically 12.4 percent, actual costs are still going to be much, much higher because of all the uh, income tax revenues required to redeem the bonds held in the trust fund to pay benefits because of this declining worker to collector ratio. So I totally agree with that. On the personal account side, um, look, I, I worked for President Bush. President Bush pushed personal accounts. I, in the abstract, I believed in personal accounts. I, I, uh, I think that if, you, if I were to sit down and, and design my perfect Social Security system from scratch, it would have a personal account component. And I absolutely agree as a general principle that a partially pre-funded system is more equitable along generational lines than a pay-as-you-go system. I think there's a real problem with a pay-as-you-go system because every time the worker-to-collector ratio drops, um, the treatment of younger generation gets worse and worse. But having said that, having said that, I think it would be a big mistake for um, conservatives to kill a potential Social Security reform de deal over the question of whether it has personal accounts in it or not. Um, we, our ability right now as a, as a government uh, to finance a transition to any sort of pre-funded system right now is much, much less than it was just a few years ago because our fiscal situation is much, much worse. Also, um, we have an enormous issue with, with cost containment and costs are going to get out of control very rapidly uh, and if that is not dealt with quickly because of an impasse over the personal account issue. Uh, we're going to get an answer that conservatives hate, which is that it's all going to be tax increases. So while in the abstract I think personal accounts are a fine idea, uh, I think conservatives would make a huge mistake by holding out for personal accounts if there is a deal on the table that would make significant progress in holding down cost growth. Alice, Bob, either one you want to add to that? Yeah. Um, you know, the term personal accounts uh, hides more than it reveals. I mean, there are all sorts of uh, ways you can do personal accounts. And, uh, you know, what I think of as Social Security is sort of the rock bottom foundation to retirement income. And uh, there's a real question of uh, how much you want that to uh, vary uh, both because of individual decisions and because of market forces over which nobody has any control. Uh, and uh, so, you know, I am not uh, philosophically totally opposed to uh, individual accounts as a supplement to something rock solid uh, or defining individual accounts as you can only invest, invest in tips and you have to transform them into annuities and, you know, a few other things like that. Uh, but the uh, market's going up uh, and down by 200, 300 points a day that uh, the crowds are going to begin to uh, uh, you know, pound on the pots and demand individual accounts. Let me just say something about demography here. <laughs> uh, and Chuck knows more about this than I, and he could tell you I'm all off base. Um, the sort of age cohort, let's say 30, 30 to 45, uh, if its payroll taxes were all going in to a private, non-governmental, non-profit uh, investment account, and that investment account was being invested in Treasury securities, it would be paying roughly what it should uh, to support the benefits we have now promised it. A lot of the problem we have is what Peter Orzag and others have called the legacy cost. It's your great-grandparents, your grandparents, and your parents. Uh, who have walked away with huge subsidy. And the question is, who should pay that subsidy? Should it be future generations of uh, workers? Or were we, in fact, relieving uh, the old age assistance program, which was a welfare program for the elderly, which never really amounted to much, but other kinds of income support for those people, of a burden that otherwise would have been picked up by general revenues. You know, and so some people say, hey, you know, this really has nothing to do with the current structure of Social Security. It has to do with the first 40 years 
and the way we chose to finance it, assume, and we assumed that population growth was you know, going to continue uh, monotonically uh, on, this, on a path that uh, would make this viable. Or the other opinion. <laughs> well, no, I, I would, I, I wouldn't um, argue with that. I, I think a point that That's I think is enough. really fine. <laughs> <laughs> but, Move but, on to the next question. Al Alice actually wants to make a comment, and we'll I just wanted to underline the uh, point that uh, Chuck made. But there is so much misunderstanding of uh, personal accounts out out there. Uh, and including in the Bush administration. I know Chuck understood it, but there were a lot of his colleagues who said, oh, yeah, there's this transition cost. But it, uh, they didn't understand how big it was, that if you diverted the current revenues into paying for benefits for future retirees, you had to make up the difference somehow, and that it was a trillion and a half program, a, a problem, or whatever it was. Uh, and my answer at that time was, Sounds like a good idea, but we just can't afford it. Uh, and I think that's still the answer. But we'll, we'll take one more question up front here. Thank you. I'm Kurt Couchman with Congressman Justin Amash. I wanted to ask about two other large and rapidly growing federal health care programs and what you would recommend doing with them. Uh, one is the defense or the military health system, and the other are um, health programs underneath the Department of Veterans Affairs. Uh, let me just speak to the defense one. Um, uh, that's huge. It's growing very fast. Uh, and it is unconscionable. Uh, the, uh, uh, it is, and we're not, remember, talking about wounded warriors or people in the service now and the treatment they get. We're talking about career uh, military and uh, the uh, uh, benefits that they get over uh, time. Uh, and the TRICARE for Life uh, is extremely expensive for all the reasons that we've just been talking about. Uh, and uh, there, But it has almost zero cost sharing. So uh, the uh, Im an important reform, however you de design it, uh, is to get those uh, retirees paying part of the cost of those benefits. Well, and many of those retirees, of course, have retired relatively young, are working somewhere else. I mean, I have a number of them working for me. None of them are on the Urban Institute's uh, plan because uh, this is so uh, cheap and uh, generous in its benefits. And at a minimum, the premiums and cost sharing associated with people, uh, uh, you know, which um, should be equalized to uh, those that the individual could uh, uh, provide in his other uh, uh, options. You know, it's so you would recommend more of um, just the same plan but more cost sharing rather than sort of like a, an add-on, like a, a voucher, I guess, that you might apply to some sort of private employer-provided health program or um, an add-on to Medicare? Well, I think you want to, you know, you want to... Uh, segment uh, veterans, I mean, uh, mil military retirees, uh, into uh, categories uh, of deserving this. And right now, uh, it's largely if you're, if you came out of the Pentagon, you're treated the same way. And, uh, you know, some people are in for 20 years. Uh, they're in a relatively safe uh, occupation, paid a pretty good wage. Uh, and then are uh, going out and uh, uh, working in the private sector, gaining retirement benefits, other benefits that way, and having their uh, their military ones as well. And uh, you know, you know, it's great if you can afford it, but right now we can't afford a lot of these things, and we have to ask ourselves, uh, you know, what does this add to national defense? You know, is it uh, you know demanded by equity or not? And, you know, for some individuals, uh, something like that is. They've had a very tough time. They've uh, uh, been separated from their families. They've been in danger, et cetera, et cetera. But for the majority, that's not the case. Thank you. So w with that, we'll end it. On behalf of the Mercatus Center, I thank you all for attending today. And if you'll please uh, give me another round of applause for Drs. Rivlin, Reischauer, and Blahaus.
Thank you.